Well, uh, good to see everyone again today. Let's uh, open with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings that you pour out upon us. Thank you for being with us, for watching us, watching over us, for being our God. I ask that you be with us during our study today. Uh, just keep us uh, uh, ever mindful of you and, and what you've done in this place um, that we're studying and what you do now and continue to do in our lives. We just ask uh, this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're on page 37 of the Regional Study Guide, and we'll be working with the number five, uh, G-A-L, uh, the Galilee map. So uh, should have uh, the Galilee map out, uh, G-A-L, that's the fifth one, the upper left-hand corner, and we're going to be on page 37 of our regional study guide. So we're looking through, uh, hopefully get through uh, point four today, uh, taking hold of the Jezreel Valley. Um, and so as we look at this, uh, uh, the Jezreel Valley focuses our attention on the Jezreel Valley, crossroads of the northern arena. Together with Lower Galilee, this valley gathers traffic from all directions and offers a unique bridge between the coastal and Transjordanian highways. The celebrated battleground of history and its approaches is presented on the Galilee map. If necessary, view the following pages and regions on the run to note special parts of the Jezreel Valley and Lower Galilee play in the Northern Arena. So I'll leave that to you on your own time if you did that uh, before today, great. If not, uh, do that after. You can see those pages that are listed here. Um, so the Jezreel Valley is really um, this thing that really kind of almost looks, uh, I've heard it um, compared to an arrowhead. So it's kind of the, look at that, that's uh, how they compared that over there. This kind of whitish part um, on the, the left side of your map, the lower left quadrant, quadrant of the map, that big whitish area. That's all of that is the Jezreel Valley. So that's what we're talking about. And then Lower Galilee is, is this area over here. So we'll, we'll jot and dive into that a little bit more. Um, can somebody read the, the next paragraph there under the Explore the Galilee map? Open the GAL map and have the earlier marked LB and NCA maps handy. Note the limits of the GAL map on its finder map, the bottom right hand corner. Compare the GAL map with the LB map you already marked and find common features such as. Lake Galilee, the Rift Valley, Mount Carmel, the Jezreel Valley, and the Arma Canyon. Try to fit the GAL map with its more complex route system into the simpler route system of the LB map. Glance at the blue arrow on the LB map and see how it flows through the area covered by the GAL map. Do the same with the blue arrows on the NCA map. In short, make yourself at home on the GAL map before proceeding with a closer look at the map below. All right, so we're not, we'll just do that a little bit. Uh, we won't go quite that in, in depth. Everybody find Mount Carmel, right? This range here. You see how much bigger it is on this map, yep. right? Uh, we found the Jezreel Valley. We pointed that out already. Um, we, we can see Lake Galilee there, right? That's uh, hard to miss on this map. The Yarmuk Canyon, does everybody remember where that is? Can everybody find that? That's over on the Transjordan. And I'm looking for it on on this map the Yarmuk Canyon uh, the Yarmuk Plain is there and so you see the the Yarmuk River that flows out of there the river is basically the canyon oh, okay. it's not actually doesn't have a label on there but uh, it's labeled on the other one so you actually get the features of the river a little bit more because we're more in that right so just we're familiar with that we know and we'll mark this as we get going but the the road, uh, every find uh, Megiddo, Megiddo, Jezreel Valley, kind of right in the middle there on the, it's right along the Carmel Mountain Range, right? So if you remember the, if you go from the coastal plain, the bottom left of this map, the road comes up and there's one of like three routes to get through um, to the Jezreel Valley. And if you go farther north, you see Akko, right? What's not on this map that's farther north? What, Tyre and Sidon, right? And so we know that those are even farther north. We can see how condensed this map is, right? And then if we go um, north of the Sea of Galilee, we see what city there, what principal city we've talked about before. We see um, Capernaum. Chinnereth, Capernaum. And all the way at the top, you see Hatzor, right below the right below the, the, the border. You can see Hatzor. Hazor, yeah. Yeah. It, it's really the Z is like a, it's a Sade, so it's a TZ, so it's hot sore, is, is how you'll hear me say it. You notice that what's not on this map is Dan. 
Dan's a, a city we've worked with a bunch. It's even farther north. So you can see how we've really condensed everything on this map, and we'll be able to go in a lot yeah, more detail. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the range hills which stretch, I'm, I'm back on page 37. The range of hills which stretches from Mark, Mark, Mount Carmel to Samaria is called the Carmel Range. That's this. We can, it's much more prominent on this map, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you can see that Mount Carmel is higher than the rest of the range, a fact confirmed by careful look at elevations on this map. The Iskander uplift falls short of Mount Carmel's highest point. Both are regions of uplifted and deeply eroded hard limestone. Between them lies the Shve Law. Say Shve Law with me. Shve Law. All right? Shve Law. Um, the PH sound there. Um, that's the lowland of Carmel. That's this area down here. This is the Shve Law of the Carmel Mountain Range, and it continues uh, even farther south. Um, it's a softer, chalky line, so much lower and much easier to cross as seen by roads on the map. Note the various ways to cross the Carmel Range from the northern Sharon Plain. All right. So the northern Sharon Plain, this is right here, right, to um, the Jezreel Valley, to the Jezreel Valley, all right. Um, the location of Megiddo made it on one of the main defensive positions guarding the Carmel Range. We talked about where Megiddo was. The Galilee map shows a series of ridges stretching across Lower Galilee. In the west, they tend to run east-west, while in the east, they angle into the Rift Valley. Routes from the Jezreel Valley to Hatsor make their way around these ridges, but routes to the Transjordan follow faulted valleys which empty into the Rift Valley and cross forwards on the Jordan before climbing to Lower Gilead and Golan. So the Gilead and Golan are over here. And so just kind of saying, hey, on this side they run this way, on this side they're running more just east-west. Right. Um, sit back now and look at the Galilee map as a whole. It shows how open Lower uh, Galilee and the Jezreel Valley are to northern invaders, right? If you're coming from the north, there's a lot of different ways to get into there. Um, unlike the south, the north has no unified barrier such as the Carmel Range, right? So there's all these different ways that you can come into the Jezreel Valley. This way, you have to come across this mountain range. So from the south, it's much more protected. From the north, not so much. Um, the only practical line of defense is a depression in the Rift Valley along the western shore of Lake Galilee. So over here. The note how an invader moving south from Hot Sur, so up here, right? Um, so we're starting there. If they're moving south from Hot Sur, uh, had to descend to below sea level to the site of Chittereth before climbing to the crossroads of Lower Galilee via Arbel and Adama. This site, this may have been uh, the threatened way of the sea mentioned in Isaiah 9, verse 1. It is clear why the same verse <laughs> refers to the entire region of Galilee of the Gentiles. It was easily overrun and difficult to defend in the past, as well as today, when Israel, Syria, and Jordan share the terrain seen on this map. So today this, so uh, um, Jordan is over here, Israel is here, Syria is up here today. Um, the two main events in this unit reveal the open character of Galilee and how Imperial armies and Canaanite forces can clearly control the routes in Galilee of the Gentiles. Other events are summarized in a look from Megiddo. Uh, Gideon's dramatic victory of the Midianites and the setting of Nazareth overlooking the Jezreel Valley in Galilee receives special attention. So uh, these are the two events. Canaanite insurgents mobilized at Megiddo and the Jezreel Valley in order to stop Pharaoh Thutmose the III's march north along the intercoastal highway to reassert Egyptian control. And Sisera's plan to, to secure Hatso's influence over the north by mobilizing Canaanite chariots at Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley is thwarted by the Israelite peasants militia on Mount Tabor, led by Deborah and Barak. So if you have always liked the story of Deborah, you know, or, or the, the, um, the female judge, uh, this is the setting we're going to be talking about that. So first we're going to look at Thutmose. Thutmose um, the third of Egypt in his triumph. Uh, he said taking Megiddo. Megiddo, Megiddo is like taking a thousand cities. It was that important. We looked at that a little bit before. Um, in the study of event one, we, uh, we're on event 12 now, uh, we heard of the Amorites, a term which means Westerners, as people in Mesopotamia, as the people in Western Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. So the people in Mesopotamia over here viewed these as Westerners, right? They're the Amorites. 
Um, look at the red line. In the, so if, you look, if we look at the chart in the back of regions on the run, um, toward the bottom you see the Amorite wave begins in a brief uh, text. Around uh, 2000 BC, the headline, Amorite influence expands um, on the Amram register. That's up in here. Um, or the Aram, I should say. Around 1700, find the headline, Amorite wave reaches Mesopotamian Egypt. Clear the Amorites were on the move in the Middle East. Uh, this is the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the scriptures. Around 1700, Egypt was relatively weak, a period known as the Second Intermediate Period. This is on page 38. It was then that a red arrow on the chart descends into Egypt near the fold of the chart. Alien rulers, the Hyksos, invade Egypt. Egyptians call these alien rulers Hyksos. Um, um, many believe that, it, that this was the Amorite invasion of Egypt from the land of Shortly before 1550, red arrows on the chart point from Egypt to the land between. Imperial blue on the chart suddenly surges north from Egypt through the land between into southern Aram. The first arrow is labeled uh, um, Amos to Sharuhen. Amos, uh, whose reign began Egypt's 18th dynasty, is credited with expelling alien rulers from Egypt. His campaign took him to Sharuhen, the southern gateway to the land between. Um, Egypt awoke to a new and mighty surge of nationalism and expansion, which lasted four centuries. This has been called Egypt's New Kingdom, a known archaeology as the Late Bronze Age. Um, glance over this area of Egyptian dominance on the chart. So we can do that. Um, this is um, this time we're talking about is, is really Egypt's greatest influence outside of Egypt. Um, According to Israelite chronologies number one and two, the Israelites left Egypt under Moses. Remember, we talked about the different chronologies there and entered the land between under Joshua. One of the greatest names in this period was Thutmose III, who ruled Egypt around 1450. As the kingdom of Mitanni in northern Mesopotamia expanded, Canaanite rulers in the land between revolted against Egypt. Thutmose marched north to reassert Egyptian control and prevent Mitanni from entering the land. Thutmose saw his conquest of Megiddo and Canaan as one of his greatest victories. So, the Canaanite peoples, the Amorites, they were subject to Egypt's rule. They, um, there was a king up here, Mitanni, that, uh, or the, this people group that was a certain influence in Mesopotamia. They were coming this way. They saw, the people here saw that there's their opportunity to revolt against Egypt. And so Egypt comes up and um, not, only, not only to confront this threat but the, of the Mitanni, but of the threat of the people in um, in Canaan at the time. So that's what we're going to be looking at. So on this map, we're going to highlight, so your yellow marker, the Sharon Plain. Um, Sharon Plain is right over here in the bottom left corner. It goes, uh, it's on its side, so do the Sharon Plain. Um, do Mount Carmel, which starts almost at the top by the sea. Mount Carmel and the Jezreel Valley. Um, which kind of sweeps in the middle of, of the, uh, the shape that's like an arrowhead there. So if you look up here, Sharon Plain is here. Mount Carmel is here. Jezreel Valley is here. So the Rift Valley um, is this section. Yeah. And it goes all the way down. It goes all the way down through the Dead Sea, and even down to the um, the right fork of the the, the Red Sea. Well, is that marked? Is it marked? Yeah. Oh, at the. Yeah. You, you don't need to mark Rift Valley, but it's. So all of the Rift Valley, here, in in Israel, all of the Rift Valley is below sea level. Which is an interesting feature. What did you just say? All of the Rift Valley that's on this map, and even as you go farther down, it's all below sea level. So this is lower in elevation than this over here. I think it's where they call it the Rift Valley. I think it's two plates two meet. Plates meet. And that's why it's lower too. Two tectonic plates meet. So if you remember back to geography or earth science when you're in school, sometimes when plates meet, they'll they'll go up. Sometimes when plates meet, they'll go over each other. Sometimes, and that's the case with the Rift Valley, they go down. And that's the case with the Rift Valley. All right. 
um, look at the area between the three, ge three geographical regions highlighted. So we just highlighted these three areas. This area here, the Carmel Mountain Range. Um, note the highways, avoid the rough higher terrain of Mount Carmel and the Iskander uplift, all right? So you, you can see like if you go, the they don't go all the way through upper Mount Carmel, they don't go through the Iskander uplift, they go around those uh, things. Uh, kind of, again, people are gonna take the easiest routes that they can, mm -hmm. right? Highlight now, so get with your yellow marker still, Megiddo, right on the edge of the range in the Jezreel Valley. And then Yaham, where is that one? Oh, Yaham is Yaham. down to the very bottom left of the map. Oh, Yaham. Yaham. You'll see, uh, you'll see the road coming. So we highlighted Sharon Plain, go just to the right of the, like the H, and you'll see Yaham. Um, you'll see the words to Aphek and Egypt there. So highlight Yaham. And then um, we're also gonna highlight Dothan. And Dothan is, um, if you go to the, it's still in the bottom left quadrant here. Uh, Dothan, uh, you'll see, if you go south of the Jezreel Valley, you'll see another little white, a smaller white spot. You'll see it says Dothan Valley. The city of Dothan is just at the bottom part of that. Can we find that? Anybody need help with that one? Yeah. Got it. You did homework already. Look at that. You're awesome. All right. So, so Dothan. Does everybody remember the significance of Dothan? Where Joseph was taken. Yeah, where Joseph uh, went to go find his brothers, and where they mm -hmm. sold him into slavery. And so uh, we kind of know they're going to Egypt. So we we actually will know what route these traders took to take Joseph. Yeah, this is where they're going. Um, um, place yourself at Yaham. So down here. And uh, consider various routes you could take to reach the Jezreel Valley. Each follows a path of least resistance and ends up in a different location. So if you go north, you follow it up to like Jokneum up here in the Jezreel Valley. If you take kind of this north and then split off to the right, um, not yet, okay. um, you end up in Megiddo. If you take the one that just goes to the east, you go just north of Dothan and end up in southern Jezreel Valley and, and close to Jezreel. All right, so just those are the different kind of three ways. So now we're going to highlight these routes across the mountain range. The first one is the Dothan Pass. So we're going to begin highlight on the route south of Yaham on the edge of the map. So the road that says to Aphek in Egypt, highlight there, go by Yaham, and then you're going to take this route that goes to the east on the north side of the Dothan Valley. Um, you're going to keep going that way. Um, it runs south of the Eskander uplift. You're going to go by uh, Ber Berkuna. I don't know how to pronounce that one. Um, continue highlighting past Heifer and Heifer and Kinnerick. And we're going all the way, sorry, um, up to Jezreel. Yeah. So go all the way up to Jezreel, and then we'll stop there for now. Everybody see where Jezreel is? Yeah. So highlight that road all the way up to Jezreel. All right. And then we're going to do the, the Aruna Megiddo Pass. And so we'll go back to Yaham and highlight north past, past Gath. Stay on that road. Uh, keep There's a fork, another fork. Keep left at that first fork. Or, so left at the, the second fork there, too. And then just north of, there's a parenthesis that says uh, K-H period uh, Vidas. Yeah. At that fork, take the right past Aruna. You see, everybody see where Aruna is? Yeah. And then follow that. Um, basically, um, when you get to the next fork, as you get closer to Megiddo, um, um, just kind of run it into Megiddo there. You can kind of take the left fork. At Aruna, you go, you're going right. Oh, okay. And you're, you're basically connecting that to Megiddo. Okay. 
That's right. This is by far the most renowned pass of the Carmel Mountain Range. It is a pass, so it's not like you could march miles wide here. You're, you're a mountain pass. Yeah. All right, so the next is the Jokneum uh, Pass. Everyone see where Jokneum is? Up in the, in the, if you look, it's, uh, so if you follow Megiddo up to the north, uh, the, the line you'll see Jokneum is the next major city. Um, there's, you pass Giba and, and those. So basically you're gonna connect that road that goes south all the way down to where you've highlighted before. So no, go, go through Jokneum, go, um, you're going to, so let's start back, sorry, let's go back to Yaham. Follow that road that's highlighted already where it splits to go by Aruna, uh -huh. go north, okay. and follow that all the way up to Jokneum. That'd be an easier way to tell you. Sorry about that. Okay. That's the most direct route to Galilee's port of Akko, um, which is farther north, which we'll highlight here in a little bit. Okay. A Dothan, Aruna, Megiddo, and Dor Jokneum valleys are natural passes of a road with softer chalks. This is uh, number six on page 38. Okay. They are uh, bordered by harder and higher limestone regions of Mount Carmel in the Iskander uplift and by softer limestones in the Svela of Carmel and Samaria. This geographical combination has made the area one of the most decisive military staging grounds in the land between. So in discussion here, um, in light of our marking above, we can understand why Egyptian sources made a point that Thutmose III called together his top advisors for a council meeting at Yahan. So he got his armies were stationed here, and okay, where are we going to go? How do we get up here and take out these guys that are threatening us? Okay. They had just completed their coastal campaign before proceeding to make a strategic military decision. Three routes, routes lay before them. The southern Dothan Pass, which also led to Tanakh, the northern Jokneum Pass toward Zepha and Jokneum, or the direct but much more dangerous Aruna Megiddo Pass, they knew that the forces of a strong Canaanite coalition awaited them somewhere along these routes. So they weren't sure where, you know, they didn't have uh, spy satellites or things that they could see where is the army stationed. They just knew that they had been gathering somewhere in the Jezreel Valley. Okay. So the following reading is from the text of the temple walls at Karnak, in Upper Egypt, uh, that's Southern Egypt, if you will, because Upper is Upper in elevation. The text records the victory of Thutmose III over Canaanite insurgents who had gathered at the city of Megiddo. Can somebody read that for us? Uh, I'll read it. Thanks, Tom. His Majesty Thutmose III conducted a war council. <clears throat> we are told this was at Yaham with his conquering army and said, that miserable rebel from Kadesh has taken Megiddo and enlisted princes from all of Egypt's formerly loyal subjects. He says, I will wait here in Megiddo. What is your counsel? The commanders responded to his majesty. Think of the difficulties on this road, Arun and Megiddo Pass. As it becomes so narrow, the report is that the enemy is there waiting and becoming more numerous. The horses will have to go single file as well the army and all the support staff. Our vanguard will engage in battle while the rear guard is still waiting in Aruna, unable to fight. There are two other roads. One is to the east of us and comes out near Tanakh. The other is to the north and comes out to the north of Megiddo. May our victorious Lord choose to use one of them so we do not have to use this difficult road. His majesty challenged the army. Keep pace with your victorious Lord's march on this narrow road. His majesty has sworn, I will not let my victorious army go ahead of my majesty on this road. His majesty marched north at the head of his army. He did not meet the enemy. Their southern wing was at Tanakh, and their northern wing was on the south side of the Queen of Valley. All right. So if you, if you follow that, you guys see where Tanakh is? So Tanakh is south. If you go to Megiddo and you go south along the range, or along the uh, Carmel Mountain Range in the Jezreel Valley, you'll see Tanakh right on, nestled in the, the foothills there, right? 
And so they gathered here and they said, we know they're gathered at Megiddo. Let's go either north or east. Those are easier passes. If we go through this one, everyone will be single file. When we start to engage the forces here, they'll be waiting for us. If we engage them here, the, the rear of the army is still going to be at Aruna because of how far spread out the army is going to be. But what ended up happening is the these Canaanite forces and others thought, well, there's no way they're going to come through that pass. And so they were all positioned over here, not guarding that difficult pass. And so the Egyptian army was able to get out uh, and through. So the Canaanite forces gathered at Megiddo did not think, I just said this, did not think the chariots would venture through the narrow Aruna Pass. They placed their camps in the valley at the two other approaches, at Tanakh to the south and somewhere north of Megiddo, but south of Jachnia. Pharaoh's advisors also knew the dangers of the Aruna Megiddo Pass and warned him against sending his chariot single file through this pass, since his disorganized forces could be overrun before they could regroup near Megiddo. That most of the scouts most likely had brought him information about the position of the Canaanite camps in the Jezreel Valley. He overruled his council's advice and gave orders to proceed through the Aruna Megiddo Pass with him at the head of his army. That's a bold move too, right? He's got no protection. Um, as it turned out, Thutmose's forts, uh, forces had time to regroup on the plain before the Canaanites could rush their men and equipment back to Megiddo. The Egyptians won the battle on the plain below Megiddo, but were so taken up with the spoil of war that the city itself had time to close its gates and man its defenses. The Egyptian army subsequently had to lay siege to the city. The opposing forces encamped on low hills just west of the city, the setting for the final scene in this episode of Megiddo's history. So you, you catch that? They, uh, they, they, wanted the, they wanted the spoil of war, so they were looting the, the tents and the bodies, and so the, those that survived that initial onslaught were able to escape back to Megiddo and close its gates um, so that instead of having an easy victory over Megiddo, they now had a long uh, siege that they had to do. All right, so we're going to be marking on this Galilee map. So we're going to do a blue circle, so get the blue one out, uh, around Yaham down here on the south uh, southwest. Yaham, blue circle around southwest. That's where the war council for uh, Thutmose the Third was. You, you've highlighted already. A blue, blue is an enemy, not Israelite. Not Israelite army is blue. In small caps, uh, black letters, um, you can write uh, there. You can do that in pen or you can use your black marker, whichever you want to do. Right, Thutmose's council to decide route. Just right above Yaham. Thutmose's council to decide route. Then we're going to get our orange marker. Typically, we use orange for Israel, but uh, because it's two non Israelite armies, they're using this just to distinguish between the two. So, in orange, um, do it, make a small orange box east of Tanakh. So uh, east means would be just to the just to the uh, below it is kind of where I put mine. I made an orange box uh, kind of below east and southeast. That's where the Canaanite army was. Um, and you can put Canaanites by that orange box. And then south of Jachneum. You're going to do the same thing. Um, there's the, it says like uh, um, T, -Q -E T period Q I R E, just east of there in the valley, make another orange box and put Canaanites. So we had uh, two camps of the Canaanites, one to block the southern advance, one to block the northern uh, route. Um, unfortunately, they didn't, you know, Pharaoh knew where they were coming through. So he didn't do that. So next to both of those in caps, you can write Canaanites. Those are where those camps were. And then we'll get our blue arrow. Everybody got that so far? I don't need to slow down a second. We'll take a, a blue sweeping arrow. It kind of can curve around a little bit. You're going to go through from Yaham. You're going to follow that middle highlighted route that we did kind of next to it, and, and draw an arrow up to and uh, ending at Megiddo. So kind of snaking up through that pass, ending at Megiddo, a blue arrow. And next to that, write Thutmos, or Thutmose.
and then and then a red circle around Megiddo. That was a battle. Yep. In the siege. All right. The importance of these passes, the Carmel passes, cannot be overestimated. They carried almost all of the commerce and military might of the ancient world passing through the land between. So we've talked about how the, the different empires wanted to get down to Egypt and how Egypt wanted to get to them. They had to go through one of these through three passes. And if there's a choke point, that lot's easier to put a toll booth in. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> you can control people. It's, it's really hard for people to go around them. So those, it can't be overstated there of what that meant. Um, so all, almost all of the commerce and military might of the ancient world passing through the land between, the land bridge between the Nile and the Mesopotamian river valleys passed through these three passes. A glance at the LBNCA and Galilee map shows the centrality of Megiddo overlooking the Jezreel Valley. Right? So maybe it was the, the, the least accommodating pass, but it was central to the other two. And so you could get from there to the other two pretty quickly. If you look at the, if you look at the, um, the, the key on the top, the, the gauge, uh, you can see that um, it's less than 10 miles to either end of that. You know, so you're probably seven or eight miles, six, seven miles. So if you're on a horse, you can get to there fairly quickly uh, from one, one of these, one of the ends of the passes to the other if you're stationed in, in Megiddo. All right. Um, the geographer George Adam Smith uh, aptly described this valley in his book, The Historical Geography of the Holy Land, a handbook for teachers and students for over a century. These are the small letters here at the bottom of 39. With our eyes on these five entrances, and remembering that they are not merely glens into neighboring provinces, but passes to, to the sea, into the desert, gates on the great road between the empires of the Euphrates and the Niles, between the continents of Asia and Africa, we are ready for the arrival of those armies of all nations whose almost ceaseless contests have rendered this plain the classic battleground of Scripture, was ever arena so simple, so regulated for the spectacle of war. As, as Julian, Jezreel is, the va is a vast theater which is clearly defined stage with its proper exits and entrances. Um, kind of how did he describe that back um, a while ago. The, so these three, and then they're talking about the, the other two would be the one to the north and the one to the east, the way out. It is clear why Thutmose the Third boasted that taking Megiddo is as good as capturing a thousand cities. His campaign provides us with one of the best illustrations of Megiddo's importance in the Jezreel Valley. That's what we just marked. All right. Uh, so just back to the the overview chart and in, in, uh, regions on the run near the end. Egypt's interest in Megiddo did not end with Thutmose's campaign. Megiddo continued to be a major Egyptian base in the land between throughout the reigns of later pharaohs of Egypt's 18th dynasty. Following a lull in campaigns, pharaohs of the 19th dynasty found it necessary to reassert Egypt's authority in the land between. Seti I reestablished Egypt's control of important sites and roads in the land between. His successor, Ramses II, reigned for 67 years and campaigned throughout Canaan and farther north into Aram, where he met Egypt's new rival, the Hittites, who claimed Aram and its approaches to the land between. Ramses' battle at Kadesh on the Or Orontes River appears on the ME map, in the latter parts of Ramses' reign, Egypt presumed that its control of the country was secure, but local peoples, including the Israelites, began to expand onto the trade routes. Uh, Mernapta, uh, Ramses' successor, returned to research Egypt's dominance. A victory hymn cites some of his conquests on his campaign and also provides us with the first non-biblical reference to the people of Israel. Ravaged is Canaan for every misdeed. Taken is Ashkelon. Captured is Gezer. Yenoam is made non-existent. The people of Israel is desolate. Its seed is not. Yeah. Its seed being not. The Israelites survived. They survived. All right. Gezer, Gezer, I, you know, yeah, that's there. So that's uh, event 12. So now we're going to Sisera's victory. So um, if we're Sisera's strategy, not his victory, he did not. Um, 
But if you look at just the, the timing of this, um, Thutmose um, was about 1450 BC, somewhere in that period. Um, now we're, we're moving um, uh, forward a few hundred years um, into the 1200s BC. Shortly before 1200, we just talked about Pharaoh Menapta died in Egypt's 19th dynasty, came to an end. At least two unsettled decades passed before the 20th dynasty emerged. And during this time, Egyptian control of Canaan must have been questioned. It may not have been in this interlude, it may, sorry, it may have been in this interlude that the ruler of the northern city-state of Hatsor mobilized fellow Canaanites against the encroaching Israelites. Menapta's campaign a few years earlier had dealt with this growing Israelite issue, Israel, the threat, and the king of Hatsor was determined to continue this policy. He knew that the commercial control of the north was at stake. So the northern tribes faced serious uh, territorial problems. They were separated from the stronger tribes of Ephraim in the, in the central hill country, and their expansion was severely restricted by Canaanite centers, which controlled important road junctions. It's talked about in Judges chapter 1. Hatsor, not named in this general list, remained the Norse chief Canaanite center and a leader in the campaign against emerging Israelites. So we're, we're talking about this. We're talking about the, the Israelites lived out here in the, in the hills, but they couldn't expand down because the Canaanite cities still controlled the cities in the valley and Hatsor being up here. And they couldn't get help from the other tribes, the four stronger tribes that were down in the, the, the hill country this way, Ephraim and Judah, and Benjamin, they were all down that way. Right. Right. The Canaanites had the upper hand in the struggle. In Judges chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, states that the northern Israelites avoided highways, and those who dared take trips kept to the back roads. Can you imagine? I mean, you're kind of seeing what they had to do. They had to go around. They couldn't take the easy route. Uh, they couldn't use the highways because they'd have been slaughtered or taxed or worse. All right. All right. Um, the situation was so bad that Barak or Barak made his way south, way south to the hill country of Ephraim for advice from Deborah, who was judging Israel at the time. As the story unfolds, Hatsor appears at the head of a northern Canaanite coalition with Sisera in command. He gathered his forces at one of the north's most strategic positions, at Megiddo, by the waters of Tanakh. We return to the Galilee map to set the stage for this exciting event. So we'll mark on there, and then we'll get the discussion and read through some of that as well. So we're going to highlight Lower Galilee and Upper Galilee. So they're kind of on the, they both cross over the center seam, but they're near the top of the map. Upper Galilee is in all caps. Um, if you go down on the seam, you'll see the, you'll go between the A and the L of Galilee, about an inch, inch and a half down. That's Upper Galilee. And then you go another two inches down, you'll kind of go through the, the seam goes through the G of Galilee for Lower Galilee. So highlight Upper Galilee and Lower Galilee, do that in yellow. And then we're going to write tribal names in green caps. Um, and you can look for the spellings in there. So, uh, so I'll kind of help point this out to you. Issachar. Um, so if you... Um, if you find the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, go towards the Mediterranean Sea, and you'll see cities like uh, Beth Shemesh, and then right below Beth Shemesh, there's a city in parentheses, you'll see En-Hada, right Issachar, right below uh, en, en Hada, or however you pronounce that. That's where you can put Issachar. All right, so not too far... So, uh, right about here. Yeah, so car is good. Just right below it. Right, right in there. Yeah. Thank you. That's why. So, around. That's what it's down here. Yeah, it is. You're right there. It's in that area. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just south of Bash and Bash. Yeah, so it's it's in that area. It's in this area. So, right there. It's right there. Yeah. Great. Is the Jordan River. Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh it's in the Rift Valley. Yep. Now the uh, the Sea of Galilee and the start of the Jordan River is about is it 10 or 12 or 10 or 15 feet higher than it was back in Jesus day uh, because they've kind of dammed the bottom and re 
because water is such a precious commodity. Um, so it's, a, it's about 10 or 15 feet higher than it was in biblical times. But, but it's still all below sea level. Uh, Zebulun. Uh, I marked that. Um, so if you uh, find Megiddo and you go north through the Jezreel Valley, you'll come to a city called Bethlehem. That is not the Bethlehem. Um, go to the right of that. Um, and I put, you'll see like a tallow and you'll see Sepphoris. Um, I put Zebulun between those two cities. Yeah. Yeah. And Sepphoris is a city, uh, a very Roman city. I think that, uh, yeah, good. Um, many think that, uh, that's going to be uh, Zebulun. Yeah. Will we go to Sepphoris? Uh, we did last time. Yeah. Uh, and many think that this is a, a city that Joseph would have worked at, and maybe even Jesus oh. with him. It was a major building project that was going on at the time. It's, it's only five miles from yeah. Nazareth. So it would have been, I mean, for us, a five mile walk kills us, but for them, that would have been an easy stroll up from Nazareth. So, yeah. Asher is up here in the hill country, kind of to the about an inch to the left or so of Upper Galilee, of the U in Upper Galilee is where I put Asher. This is the general. So the U of Upper Galilee, about an inch to the left is where I put Asher, a kind of just to the, just below Gath in that area. Again, a different Gath than the one, like the Philistine Gath. And then Naphtali. Naphtali, um, I, so, uh, in Upper Galilee, uh, I put it below about a half an inch or an inch below the I-L-E in Galilee is where I put that. And just kind of in that hill country there. Yeah. Um, near which one? Yeah, I put it south of that. Yeah. I put it south of Tekoa there. But it's, okay. it's all in that area. You're, if you're, wherever you mark it there, you're in the right region for understanding that this was their land that they were in. Again, they, you, you got to have as much as you could defend. And so this was the region that they were in. And these, were the Israelites. These, are, these are all these tribes, tribes of Israel. Of Israel. Yeah. These are the northern yeah. tribes of Israel. We're going to mark Manasseh uh, to the south of the Jezreel Valley. Still in green. Still in green. Um, you see the Iskandar uplift. I marked that right below. Uh, so I marked Manasseh between the Is uh, Iskandar uplift and that road we highlighted earlier. I marked it between those two. The southern route. The southern route, yep. Oh. So below Iskandar uplift. Right here? Yep. <coughs> yep. And that's Ibukar, again, another tribe of Israel. No, no, Manasseh. no Manasseh. Sorry, Manasseh, another tribe of Israel. They are not the principal tribes of Israel. We know, like the sons of Jacob, we know Joseph and Benjamin and Judah right. and Ephraim, and, and those are the ones that stand out to us more, and Levi. These are the ones that didn't really ever have kings. <coughs> they were part of the tribe, but they were the ones who just showed up with the other 12. Just like the disciples, yeah, Peter, James, John, yeah. Andrew, right? You know that one. <laughs> but uh, but otherwise, um, yeah, otherwise, you know, the other, where are the other ones? Maybe we could come up with them if we thought about it. The principal tribes were Ephraim, Judah. Benjamin had Saul come from it, so we know that one. We know Joseph. Uh, Joseph's two sons, the, Ephraim is one of them, but Manasseh is the other one. Uh, Reuben's the firstborn, so maybe you know that one. Um, if you watch Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, you kind of have to know them for one of the songs, so that's fun. So, um, <laughs> so but, in other words, these are not always the first 12. These are the first 12. Oh, all right. These are okay, part of the 12. Sons of, right, okay. So, I, I, so these are all sons of Jacob. If you remember uh, back to your history, Levi doesn't get its own territory. 
because they were the priestly clan. They're spread out and have cities throughout all of Israel. And then to still have it be 12 tribes, um, <coughs> Joseph, the favorite son, who got the coat of many colors, his two sons um, are given each a portion with their uncles, basically. Oh, okay. So Joseph, in a sense, gets the birthright, a double portion of what the other brothers get. And that's where Ephraim and Manasseh come from. Those aren't, those are technically grandsons of Jacob, not sons. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Clear as mud? Yeah. I'm crying. Yeah. So put a blue dot, um, blue on the city dot of, the, of identifiable unconquered Canaanite centers in Judges um, 1, verses 27 through 33. We're not going to read those, but these are in Judges, it says, hey, these cities remained yet unconquered after the time of Joshua. They didn't conquer these Canaanite cities, right? They were supposed to conquer, but these ones remain unconquered. So in the tribal territory of Manasseh, so Manasseh is down here, you're going to put a blue dot on that, well, it's farther to the right, but um, I might have, so Bet Sean is way over to the right. So Manasseh can kind of spread through there too. Yeah, and remember, Manasseh also was on the Ukraine. Yeah, so they have they Manasseh has a big territory over here. Um, so Bet Shan, remember Bet Shan? We talked about that before. It's also Sithopolis. Uh, Sith put a blue dot, just uh, put blue on that dot that's there. A uh, Tanakh, which we've been talking about already. Put the blue on the city not dot for Tanakh. Put a blue on the city dot for Megiddo. And then Iblium, I forget where this one is. Oh, just so just, so where Dothan is, you're going north and, and west. And Dor's on the coast. Oh, thank you. And Dor is way over on the coast. Where is the other one? Which one? What's it start with? Bet Shan Tanakh Dor Iblium. You don't have to do a tour. Okay, so um, we have Dothan highlighted. You have Dothan highlighted there. Um, so just to the right of Manasseh. And if you follow the road that's below Manasseh, and you'll see uh, Burakuna. If you look right below that one, is where Iblium is. So those those were unconquered cities. You see where are they at? They're in the valleys. They're the major trade routes. And on the coast. And on the coast there, which is again another another kind of major route farther mm -hmm. away. They didn't conquer these. Um, in the tribal territory of Asher. These are the ones that are listed. So Asher is farther up here to the north. A T Ako, which is, um, if you see Ako Tol Ptolemies, which is on the, the coast, is the port. Just inland from there is T Ako in parentheses. Afek, if you go south of there, uh, by the name and stream is Afek, about two inches south of T Ako. And then Ray. Hob. If you go kind of east, straight east from Tiaco, you'll see Rahab with a question mark there. So again, these are the routes that get up to Tyre and Sidon, to the Phoenicians. They didn't get those routes covered, did they? They didn't conquer those cities. All right, All right we're going to get back our, our yellow one out. We're going to highlight Hot Sore in the far north. All right. And draw a blue box around it if you haven't yet. <coughs> Try not to mix the color. Do you like that? Don't mix color. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the leader of this is the leader of the Canaanite cities. A hot sore. Um, hot sores tell is just unbelievably huge. It's it's kind of ruined it there. They haven't excavated hardly any of it. But it's just the area of Hatsor is huge. It was one of the principal cities in the world uh, before this time. 
We should. We should. Yeah. In the Bronze Age, by the time the Israelites had Hatsor, they didn't uh, they didn't occupy as much of it. And so there's an upper city and a lower city. And the upper city and lower city combined is one of the largest city areas. And that was during the Bronze Age. And yep. then the upper city is the Israelite area, which is smaller. They left a smaller footprint. But uh, there's some really cool things up there. You see a full uh, Salamic gate up there. They also have one of the best preserved four-room houses up there. They show, they have a preserved uh, granary up there. They have a preserved water system. There's a lot to see in Hot yep. All right, so we're gonna highlight some of the routes. Um, from Megiddo, where we have the, kind of that, that pass that's there. So from Megiddo, to Hot Sor is where we're going. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna go across the Jezreel Valley to the east there. So the road just south of Megiddo that goes to Afula, which is in parentheses. That's the road you're gonna highlight, okay? And then you're gonna keep going, which let me tell you right. Um, and then we're gonna go to Endor. Um, so as you go through Afula, as you keep going to the east, you're gonna take the northern branch by Nain right? Which is where Jesus healed the widow's son. Um, and basically through Nain. This, that road that goes through Nain uh, to Endor. To Endor. And that's where Saul saw the witch or the medium of Endor. Um, so, and then we're going to go um, sorry, I lost my spot. Through uh, Lubia. Uh, so we're basically when we, when we get to the when we get to the north-south road just east of Endor, we're going to cut to the north and go on that northern road. You'll cross over another east-west road, and you'll see Lubia up there. So you're going probably about six inches to get to Lubia. You're going to continue north on the road by Bia. Go just on the road just north of Arbella. North, uh, the road that goes north of Mount Arbel. Um, and then on the road uh, that takes you on the left-hand side, the Gennesaret Plain by Lake Galilee into Chinnereth. And then from Chinnereth, you're going to go on the road basically straight north to Hatsor. All right, so I will uh, come around and then help you on that if you missed it or, or got lost in there. That's okay. So here up to here. Oh, here is where I got lost. Yeah. Okay. And then from Lubia. North of Arbel, stay in this side of Chinnereth and go to Hatsor. Yeah. Great. Right. Anybody else? Anyone else got a. We're good? I'm feeling like that one. All right. Well. So that was the, the route that they would take. You can see there's the, the passes that they're going on and, and taking in the, midst of, in the midst of that. All right. The interesting thing is, I, I just looked on the modern map. That's still the road that you take really? oh. 3,000 years later. Highway 65. Yeah. <laughs> right, from the Dothan Pass. So Dothan Pass, uh, we got to Jezreel, basically. Which we're kind of, we ended last time there. Um, so from, we're going Jezreel. Um, we're going to, um, over to Bethshan, um, is where we're going to end up. So we, uh, so from Jezreel, we're kind of going uh, up into the east. So the no, northern Harod Valley route. So you see the Harod Valley to the right of Jezreel. Jezreel. We're taking the northern route through the Harod Valley to Betshan. There's two routes to get there. It wants us to take the northern one through the Harod Valley. They basically run parallel. And why didn't the road run through the middle of the valley? It could flood. It could get swampy. Oh. And so they would go. They would go basically as flat as they could towards the both sides of the where the hills started to go up. That's where it was flattest and was the driest. Um, now today they've controlled that a lot more, and so you can have roads that run through it and not have a problem. All right. Um, from Jokneum to Hatsor, we're going to go via Bethlehem um, of Galilee. So 
Jokhnium we highlighted. Um, so uh, from there, we're, there, there's two roads. One goes basically straight north. The other one goes northeast. We're taking the one that goes northeast, so to the right, up by Bethlehem of Galilee. And then we're going to keep going on that road, cross that crossroads, um, and we're going to go up to Hananoff. Has also As Asokos underneath it. Um, from there, we're going to go east. And then we're going to go on the northern route by Turan or Turin and Machana up to Kefir Hitaya, and then we'll join into the other route that we highlighted. Okay. From Tiako, which is up here, we kind of put a blue dot on that, if you remember, it's uh, on the northern part of the map by the coast. From Tiako to Hananoth. So we're gonna kind of Take the, there's a couple southwesterly routes. We're going to take the one that goes to Hanath, uh, where we already highlighted there. And then from the highlight route by uh, KH uh, Birkin. Hey guys, we're going to go northwest to Tanakh, Megiddo, Jokneum, and north via towards the way. So, um, so down here where Ibneum is, uh, just north of Dothan is where we're highlighting from. So the, basically the route that runs along the, uh, the eastern part of the Jezreel Valley. So all the way up past Afek to Tiako. Um, and then all the way up to the to north off the map to Tyre and Sidon. Yeah, sorry, no problem. Okay. Sorry, I didn't help you find that first city. So we're going basically from right here. Yeah. We're highlighting this road all the way up here. Okay. There's one here we're going to highlight. Up to. So, so highlight from Tiako to the head of that. So starting here. So, so we're actually going to start right here. So we're just going to highlight this route all the way up. Got it. So I think I yep. that Hannah thing. I don't think I've done oh, that. Oh, sorry. Here. I think I have that. Does that make sense? We that's were going to go down here. I did it. <laughs> I think that's. Oh. Just mark that one. Too. Oh. You're right. They took all of the roads that are on here, but these are just more the principal ones that they're talking about to make sure we see the connections between them. That's so, what so with that, with that marked. Um, yeah. I do want to read through Yeah, I do want to read through here uh, Judges 4. So Judges 4, we don't we won't necessarily do everything through 4 and 5 these two chapters, but this is now that we've got this marked Judges chapter four. This is this this is the setting for for Deborah. Judges chapter four, verse one. So, and we'll just kind of read through this. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. That's a fun story. Um, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who ruled at Hatzor. So that's way in the north on this map. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoim. 
And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the tree, under the palm of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. So that's not even on our map. That's south of here, right? Um, in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinuim, from Kedesh Naphtali and sent him. So he's from Naphtali. So he's from um, up in this area, which isn't too far from Hatzor, right? He's from this area, neighboring, hiding up in the hills. And she's way down here. And she's way down. So remember, he's taking back roads because they were afraid to use the main ones. Uh, and she said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali, the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon and with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. So the, the Kishon um, is the stream that runs basically uh, along that last road we highlighted that, that runs along the Carmel Mountains. That's where the Kishon River runs. All right. Um, and Barak said, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels. And Deborah went with them. Now Heber, the Kenite, had separated from the Kenites and descendants. And so they're... So um, verse 12, Sisera was told that Barak had gone up to Mount Tabor. Uh, Mount Tabor is um, right here. So um, if and we'll, we'll just kind of circle that in a little bit. Mount Tabor is right in here. Um, so um, if you remember where Endor and Nain were, uh, Mount Tabor is right north of there. So that's where we're talking about. Um and so they go with the 10,000 men, and then the Lord routed Sisera before his chariots and his army, before, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Hagarsheth Hagroim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. And if you remember this story, this is where it gets kind of gruesome. Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hatzor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside into her tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave it to him to drink and covered him. And she said, at, and he said to her, Stand the open of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took the tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. She went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said, Come, I'll show you. And so God subdued the king. All right. It's a fun story, right? <laughs> Gory deaths of the Bible. Not so much for Sisera. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Barak came from Kadesh of Naphtali. This was not the Kadesh near Hatzor, but rather the Kadesh of Naphtali located on the slopes above the southern southwest shore of Lake Galilee. So we're talking um, over in this area here. <coughs> um I don't have that one marked. Um, oh, it's Deborah, right there at the bottom of the lake. Okay. Great. All right, so uh, Deborah was concerned about the situation in the north. Summoned him for a meeting. She was judging Israel from much more secure position between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, perhaps at a spring by Mizpah on the lower part of the NCA map. We don't need to find that right now. Deborah and Barak... Uh, agreed to muster the northern Israelite militia at the prominent site of Mount Tabor, located between the tribal territories of Zebulun, Naphtali, and Issachar. Meanwhile, Sisera, in the service of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned Hatzor, mobilizes Canaanite forces at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. From their position on Mount Tabor, above the broad plain of Tabor, um, to Hatzor. Uh, the Israelites, sorry, the Israelites could see the area of Megiddo in the highway which ran from Megiddo past Mount Tabor to Hatzor. Uh, the Israelites effectively separated the Canaanite forces from Hatzor. As the Canaanites approached Mount Tabor, the stage was set for, for a decisive battle between the Canaanite territory and the ill-equipped Israelite peasant militia. So they're right. So you can see, um, you can see. So the the Jezreel Valley, all this white stuff is the Jezreel Valley. 
you can see clearly all the way across it. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll be up at Nazareth, which is on the edge. You can see all the way to Megiddo. If you're in Megiddo, you can see all the way across. You can see Mount Tabor. As it's, a, it's a perfectly formed little mountain. Um, our our uh, guide last time, our instructor last time, she said, it's what every mountain should be. It's like the ideal because it's this perfectly rounded little dome of, of a mountain, right? Um, and you can see uh, Mount Moray, and you can see just all the features as you go across. You can see the whole landscape, and that's where they're at. So find the name Kishon Stream northeast of Mount Carmel. So we're up here, the Kishon Stream. This is number six. Uh, between it and, and follow it upstream past, so we're going south. Um, and you're just going to follow that as you go on. The stream breaks into a northwestern branch and a southern branch. The southern branch reaches all the way to Beth Hagen. We're not using any color right oh. now. We're just we're just looking. We're just finding it. Okay. Go yeah. Um, this is the same stream, by the way, which Elijah later draws water from with his battle on Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal. That's the, the Kishon, okay. right? Um, and Mount Gilboa. Um, and so this, it goes all the way around that. You go even all the way south of Megiddo and Tanakh. Uh, it follows kind of down the way this system um, that's there. Um, all right. Um, you can trace the tributaries, but we're not worried about that today. Um, right Kishon Stream in small black caps alongside the branch of the Kishon North of Afula. I don't know if I did that. So where's Afula? Anybody see that one? Afula is uh, on the road from oh, I see uh, Megiddo. It. And then there's that branch of the Kishon stream that's just above it. It's dotted. So, so Afula, if you go from Megiddo and you follow the highlighted road to the east, you'll run into Afula. And then the, the dotted line above that on that one, right, Kishan Stream. You actually see Kishan System uh, going in capital letters, but like Kishan Stream on that the one. Line? The dotted line, yeah. Blue dotted line. It's not a very big stream. Which means sometimes it might be a dry riverbed. Oh, okay. Depending on the time of year. Yeah, and that's the one he said that's, that they So that's where. All the way down. So that whole part is it's all part of that same system. This one up here is what they used to, for the bale challenge. So we're going challenge. Okay, down here. Yeah. And then it this is where I put it. Is that kind of right? Oh, no. So right, right yeah. here. Right okay. Here. Yeah. So right keep on on right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
It is. And then uh, go. That's the perfect model. It is. Yeah, if, according to Aubrey. Okay. All right. If you go to, uh, to Lake Galilee, if you go to the south of Lake Galilee, you'll see, uh, just to the left, you'll see, or just below it, you'll see Yenoam. And then to the left of that, you'll see Oak and Zananim. Mm -hmm. Highlight Oak and Zananim. This is where he fled to. Mm -hmm. Cicero. Okay. Yeah. Put a red confrontation mark just below the elevation, reading 121, 397. Basically, um, by the Owen Tabor on the left side of that road, put the, a red confirmation mark. We're putting a red confrontation yeah. mark. Kind of where you drew your graph. Yeah, yeah so that I know. Right, right around in that area. Oh, yeah. got it. Yeah. I did that so long ago. Yeah. <laughs> so long ago. All right. All right, and then. Um, Where do you want to do that at? Um, at the top of the blue arrow. So, yeah. Just like that swooping blue arrow you had at the beginning of all this. Oh, well, never mind. So, And then, and then the, uh, the Oh, I can do that one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and it's going, I think, is it the Oak of Abilene? From Mount Calabar? So from the confrontation mark, Cicero runs away. Yeah, Cicero runs away. So this is uh, this is 16, the blue flight arrows from that red confirmation mark um, to the southeast via Endor and then east of the Oak of Zanoim. So you're going to cut down south a little bit and then up towards that Oak of Zanoim that we highlighted. So I'm going to show this. Just what I did on the board so you can see what I'm talking about there. Yeah. So, all right. All right, let's finish the discussion of this, and then we'll uh, finish the discussion, and then we'll um, be done with there for today. All right, so the Canaan Israel battle was fought on the plain of Tabor, probably near the plain's water divide around the 121 uh, meter elevation reading. To the west of this elevation, tributaries drain into the poorly drained Nahal uh, stream bed of Kishon. Judges 521 in the poetic portion of the biblical text suggests that. Just before, during the battle, Cloudburst made the Kishon a surging Nahal stream bed, which is why Cicero left his chariot, because it was stuck in the mud. Otherwise, you're not going to leave your chariot if it's going just fine, but it got stuck in the mud, so he abandoned the ship and took off running. That's really what had, had happened there. That's why he left his chariot. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for him to leave his chariot, but it talks about this storm that came up, right? The rich alluvial soil of the area would have been quickly transformed to heavy mud and practical for chariot warfare. The Israelite peasant militia, however, were on foot and used these conditions to their advantage. They quickly turned certain disaster into a stunning victory, a reminder of how their forefathers had been delivered from Pharaoh's chariots of the Red Sea. Cicero left his chariot and fled east of Mount Tabor by foot to the tent of a certain Kenite named Heber, whose wife was Jael. The Kenites had joined the Israelites during their wilderness wanderings and lived far to the south. Heber, however, had moved his herds north and had pitched his tent by the Oak of Zanaim. The climax of the Israelite victory over the un, uh, urbanized Canaanites of the north came by the hand of a tent-dwelling woman. You may want to reread the poetic rendition of the story to capture more of its drama and exaltation after the surprise victory. Like other biblical poems, it captures the spirit of the moment. We're not going to do that today. Uh, you can go back and do that if you want to. That's Judges chapter 6. What followed the Israelite victory over the Kenite coalition led by Hatsor is not record, recorded. About this time, however, Hatsor had suffered a disaster which included the burning and destruction of the last proud Canaanite city. Who did this is still uncertain. What is known is that in the decades after 1200, the land between slipped from the reins of Egypt and the Israelites, uh, together with surrounding peoples, began to emerge as entities in the land between. The Age of Nations had begun. And in the following centuries, the northern Israelites ultimately rode their own chariots across the battlefield of the country. The contest we have just traced, however, happened much earlier when the future of the northern tribes appeared to be hopeless. The writer of the book of Hebrews must have had this event in mind when he spoke of those whose weakness was turned to strength in battle and included Barak in his list of those who lived by faith in Hebrews chapter 11. All right, we've got four things to mark, and then we're going to be done and move on to some of those details. Sorry, it's taking a little longer to get through this section. In order to complete the main northern highway systems, we're going to highlight the following routes. Um, so from Hananoth to Lower Golan via Adimi, Nekeb, Jabneel, Yudea, and so on off the map. So we're going to go to Hananoth. Hananoth, if you remember, is um, in north of kind of where we marked Zebulun. Okay. We have the Tiako coming down. Um, from Hananoth, we're going to go um, to Lower Golan via. So we're, we're going to go to the right where we split off to go to the north before. We're going to take the farther, the southern, uh, southern of the east-west roads uh, south of the Tiran Valley. And then you, if you keep following that road straight, you'll run into, towards the Sea of Galilee, you'll run into Ad, Adami Nekeb. And then you'll follow that by the Jebneel Valley to Jebneel. You'll go towards the Oak of Zananim, but continue going east-west. Um, and then you'll follow that road, um, the northern route of that road through the um, Rift Valley, the Yarmouk Plain. And then that'll take you north and off the map. So we're basically going around, dipping around the Sea of Galilee. There you go. From Bet Shan, 
that Shan, which is in the near the Rift Valley here, we're going to mark two different paths. We're going to go to Lower Gilead via Ephron. So Lower Gilead via Ethron is actually farther north. All right. So you see how there's there's three kind of roads that go to the east out of Betshan. We're going to take the one farther north for about an inch, and then we're cutting straight across the Rift Valley towards um, Ephron. Okay. So follow the road toward Ephron, and then Rogalim, and then Beth Arbal, Arbel, and off the map. And then from Betshan, we'll go kind of the, of the three that are there, we're going to go the one that's going to the south east, not the one straight south, but the one southeast, uh, towards Jabesh Gilead. South of Pella to Jabesh Gilead and then off the map. All right, and then the okay. then from Betshan to Tiako. So we're going to go the other way. So go to Betshan, and we're going to go to Tiako. Um, find Shunem, follow the road, uh, not the one that goes to Jezreel, but when it splits off to the north to Shunem and to Afula, basically. Yeah, Afula, and then to Sarid. In Shimron, all the way up to Shaflium, all the way up to Tiako. Okay. And that's where we're going to close this piece today, and then we'll go through some details today. Sorry, we'll go a little past 12 today because of our timing. Sorry about that.